well today what i had decided was that uh, till yesterday we have completed the basic of calculating the frictional factor the sorry the frictional pressure drop because the other pressure drops more or less they were quite straightforward depending upon whether there is going to be an area change or whether there is going to be a quality change or whether the compressibility effects are quite remarkable we will have an acceleration pressure drop if it is a non horizontal we will have a gravitational pressure drop and uh, frictional pressure drop at all times it is going to be there. So, the thing which I had concluded in the last class was more or less we have completed the homogeneous flow model. The only thing which was left was a discussion on the denominator part. So, regarding that since I found that many of you you are not very conversant with compressible flow. So, I thought I will just brush up a few things of compressible flows and maybe I will take maxima one or two classes not more than that. And then from there once you understand compressible flows when we did, did, did when we write down the momentum balance equation for compressible flows we find that for that particular situation also a denominator term comes. So, we are going to first understand the significance of the denominator term for compressible flows and then accordingly we can understand the significance of the denominator term for two phase flow under homogeneous equilibrium conditions. You will notice as we go subsequently for the separated flow model, there also a denominator term is going to appear. It will always appear whenever the compressibility of the phases have to be considered because it comes from the fact that V is a function of P. Okay. So, therefore, uh, after this also whenever for separated flow or for such other conditions we get the denominator term, it will be easy for us to correlate it with equivalent useful parameters. Okay. So, I will start from the basics some basics of compressible flow. So, that may be it may, may be a repetition for some of you, but anyhow more or less I will just touch upon the basics and then we will proceed further. Okay. So, suppose we take up now whenever we talk of compressible flows the first thing is what is compressibility. Okay. So, how do we define compressibility? Any idea how do we define compressibility of, a, of any particular substance? What is the way by which we define the compressibility of a substance? Very true, all of you are more or less to some extent it is correct inverse of bulk modulus the change of density with uh, pressure and so on and so forth. Okay. So, the basic definition is it gives you a measure of its change in volume gives a measure of change in volume under the action of this actually I should have prepared a slide but anyhow under the action of normal compressive forces this is what is important. So, it is a measure of the change in volume of the substance under the action of normal compressive stresses on any fluid element. So, this is the thing and what are this normal compressive forces now for any fluid element at rest the normal compressive stress is its hydrostatic pressure. Okay. So, for any fluid in rest normal compressive stress is nothing but hydrostatic pressure. So, therefore, the degree of compressibility it can be characterized it is usually characterized by two parameters. The first parameter is the bulk modulus of elasticity. The two parameters which characterize the degree of compressibility of a substance is first thing is bulk modulus of elasticity which is usually defined as you know these definitions probably this is defined in this particular form. So, it the negative sign naturally it shows that increase of pressure causes decrease in the volume or in other words this delta V by V it is we know that it is nothing but 
delta v by v it is nothing but minus delta rho by rho where v is the specific volume and rho is the density. So, from there we get E equals to limit we can also write it in terms of density in this particular form. In other words rho d p d rho this can be one particular thing this is one, but usually for fluid cases apart from bulk modulus of elasticity we prefer to use a second definition. Any idea what that definition is? We prefer to define it in terms of compressibility kappa, but this compressibility it is nothing but 1 by rho d rho d p or rather minus 1 by v d v d p. So, from these two comparing these two you can very well understand that uh, kappa is nothing but equal to 1 by E. Now, remember one thing whenever we are dealing with any gaseous substance and for a gaseous substance whenever we try to compress it we find that a change in pressure changes its volume and it also changes its temperature. So, unless temperature is maintained constant or unless the temperature is specified this compressibility term has got no meaning. Okay. So, therefore, if we just define kappa it is not very useful we have to define the isothermal coefficient of compressibility. In other words this is defined in this particular form where this can be written down as del V del P at constant t this is the correct definition or in other words this can be written down as 1 by rho del rho del p constant t. I hope you can differentiate between rho and p that I have written down okay. and so therefore from here we find that for real gases which are far removed from their liquid states for such gases usually the ideal gas equation is quite valid for which we can write p equals to rho r t we know it and we know that whenever the gas undergoes any particular process then for that particular circumstances we can describe the process in terms of p by rho n equals to say a constant k is not it where depending upon the value or rather p v to the power n equals to k, where depending upon the value of k or rather the value of n it depends upon the process that we adopt all of us know it n equals to 1 for isothermal process n equals to gamma for adiabatic processes and so on and so forth. Okay. So, for adiabatic processes more or less we know that d v d p it is equal to minus v by x p or n p sorry it is uh, d v d p equals to minus v by n p and so from there we, are, we can very well define that your E the bulk modulus of elasticity this is nothing but n p and kappa equals to 1 by n p this we, we know very well and we can define. Now, whenever this is for fluids at rest whenever a fluid is at rest what happens it is its density or its specific volume it changes with pressure we can define it either with bulk modulus of elasticity or with the coefficient of compressibility whenever we define it in terms of compressibility since a change in pressure brings about a change in volume as well as the temperature it has to be an isothermal coefficient of uh, your um, uh, compressibility. Okay. Now, whenever a fluid is moving now under that circumstances what happens under that circumstances we know very well you know it from Bernoulli's equation a very well known fact that the pressure head and the velocity head they have to be conserved is not it or in other words for flow problems what we, we already know is we know that p it is or rather p plus rho u square by 2 this is equal to constant okay. or we can write down that delta p in any particular flow field that is more or less equal to rho u square by 2 which is nothing but the dynamic head. Okay. Now, 
we know that <laughs> delta rho by rho this is nothing but equal to okay, I will derive a little it will be easier for you if how did we define e it was limit delta v tends to 0 minus delta p delta v by v is not it. And just like I had written it down this is nothing but equal to this particular term is not it. Now, we know e in terms of density if we have to define then e will be equal to this I had already done this is delta p by delta rho by rho or it is rho d p d rho. So, therefore, we can write d p is nothing but equal to e d rho by rho. Can we write it down from the basic definition of the bulk modulus of elasticity? We can we, we can very well write down this this particular equation agreed and we, we can substitute this particular this particular d p in the d p which we had obtained from Bernoulli's equation. Okay. So, we can substitute this particular d p in the expression which, which is obtained from the Bernoulli's equation is not it. And so, therefore, from here what do we get? We get that delta rho by rho this is nothing but equal to delta p by e this is rho u square by 2 e or in other words this is half u square by e by rho. Can we write it down in this form yes or no? I am just doing basic substitutions and what is this e by rho? from Laplace equation any idea of what is this e, e by rho? e by rho very good e by rho this is nothing but a square where a is the acoustic velocity or the velocity of sound in that particular medium. So, therefore, what do we get? We get delta rho by rho is nothing but equal to half m a square correct. So, therefore, from this equation what do we get? If delta rho by rho is very small that means, the density is not affected by pressure and the fluid is incompressible you agree with me. So, therefore, delta rho by rho is very small means Mach number is very small. So, now do you understand you all of us you have already known that Mach number it is the most important characterizing parameter for compressible flows. This equation explains why this is so. Agreed. So, therefore, we find that in order to define the compressibility or the non compressibility you have to see how by how much amount the density changes for unit changes in pressure and how much amount is it, it changes that can be related with the Mach number under that particular conditions. Agreed. So, therefore, we know that for incompressible flow or for incompressible gases delta rho by rho has to be very small okay, or Mach number has to be very small. Now, we know one thing that if we consider that we can allow a 5 percent change of delta rho by rho. See even for that Phi, if we allow that 5 percent change of delta rho by rho under that condition also and if we substitute it here then your m a it is almost equal to 0 0.33 agreed. And for the corresponding to this particular m a the a the velocity of sound we know it is it is 340 meters per second under STP or a 340 meters per second at STP. So, therefore, this gives u it is more or less about say 110, 112 meters per second. Do you get? So, even for a 5 percent change in density we find that the velocity of flow has to be greater than about 110 meters per second in order to manifest compressible flow characteristics.
So, for most of the cases we can ignore the compressibility of the gaseous phase even because usually under normal circumstances we as chemical engineers or mechanical engineers we probably we do not go to such high flow conditions for aerodynamics etcetera it is very very important. Okay. So, from this we, we understand why under most circumstances we can deal or rather we can treat the gas phase as incompressible, but if you do so you can do so you can complete the calculations, but at the end you have to show that the density changes was negligible. For any problem that you do, you can assume incompressible flow, you can, you can do the entire problem, we will be doing a problem tomorrow which will enable you to understand this, but at the end you have to show that compressibility effects are very, very small, okay, that has to be shown at the end. So, from here we find out that number 1 how to define compressibility and number 2 why Mach number is so very important for compressible flows. The next thing for which we should find out what is it? We know that for, for in order to define or in order to quantify compressible flows, we need to know and or rather we need to know the Mach number under that particular conditions. For knowing Mach number, we need to know the velocity of flow and the velocity of sound under that particular conditions. So, now let us see how to express velocity of sound in terms of measurable parameters. Agreed? So, if we want to find out a measure of the velocity of sound. Now, suppose we, we take maybe any particular compressible flow. Now, when we have an incompressible fluid okay, and in that particular incompressible fluid, we send a pressure pulse. What happens? It displaces the, the particles whenever it is propagating it is displacing the particles, these particles displace more and more particles and then overall all the particles they get displaced. For compressible flows what happens? As, as the pressure pulse is traveling it displaces the particles, moment it displaces the particles, the particles move ahead and then it, it increases the, the density of the adjoining area. As it uh, the increases the density of the adjoining area then it again increases the density of the next adjoining area. In this particular way, when a pressure pulse propagates in compressible flow, we find that more or less it is it, it propagates by increasing the density of the fluid through which it is traveling. Initially, if the density was rho, then now it is rho plus d rho. So, as the pressure pulse is traveling, all the properties they change say pressure P to P from P to P plus D, P T to T plus D, T rho to rho plus D rho. In this particular way, the pressure pulse propagates and when it is propagating through a fluid at rest, then it also imparts some velocity to the fluid, which is much less as compared to the acoustic velocity or much less to the velocity of the pressure pulse. If we assume that the pressure pulse is of infinitesimal strength, then we can approximate it as a acoustic wave right elastic wave or an acoustic wave okay so now let us see under such circumstances let us picturize the situation say in this particular case we find that the pressure pulse it is traveling in this particular direction maybe from the right to the left it is traveling at a velocity u okay now while it is traveling it displaces a particle and when it displaces the displaced mass it compresses and increases the density of the neighboring mass. This increases the density of the adjoining mass and in this particular way it travels. Okay. So, now since the pressure pulse it is traveling in this particular from this particular direction it has not reached this particular portion. So, in this particular this portion on the left hand side the fluid is at rest it is undisturbed it is not affected by the pressure pulse till now. So, here the properties will be p t rho and u will be equal to 0. Okay. And since it has already traveled from here, here it is going to be p plus d p, t plus d t, rho plus d rho. Okay. And since it is traveling, it imparts a very small velocity d u to the fluid. Okay. So, this what I have represented, it is a moving wave of say frontal area 
the cross sectional area through which it is moving frontal area A. Okay. So, <laughs> we find that the disturbance it is traveling in the form of an elastic wave or a pressure wave through the medium. Now, if the amplitude of the elastic wave assuming that the amplitude of the elastic wave is infinitesimal so <laughs> then amplitude of elastic wave infinite then it can be we, we can assume it to be an acoustic wave or a sound wave as a result of which its velocity can be defined as a the acoustic velocity in that particular medium under that particular conditions. Okay. Now, when this infinitesimal pressure pulse is propagating at the speed a towards still fluid at the left. So, the properties I have defined as I have shown here. Now, for steady state analysis what we can do? For steady state analysis we can superimpose another velocity a from this particular direction. So, that what happens your uh, uh, pressure pulse it, it becomes stas stationary at one particular location is not it we can do it we, we can superimpose a velocity a from this particular direction. Now, moment we do this what happens we find out that in here if we superimpose then we find that more or less the pressure pulse it becomes constant at any particular location. Okay, pressure pulse which has a cross sectional area of A. Now, for this circumstance what happens we find that for this particular section we find that fluid is entering from this direction, fluid is moving out from this direction and in this direction fluid is entering at A. This fluid is under conditions of P T rho and the fluid is going out from this particular control volume. The outlet conditions are P plus d p t plus d t rho plus d rho and here the velocity was u equals to a and in this case it will be u equals to a minus d u. Yes or no? Did you understand this particular portion? For just for, for performing the mass balance and the momentum balance we want a particular control volume. So, what we do we, we enclose that infinitesimal area which is by which the pressure pulse is enclosed and that particular small area it is actually traveling. So, what we do we superimpose another velocity from the opposite side. So, that that small area it becomes stationary and then we can assume that fluid is entering into that area from the left hand side, fluid is going out from the right hand side. So, now for this particular fluid entry and out in that particular small cross sectional area under steady state conditions we can perform the mass balance as well as the momentum balance. You got my point. So, therefore, for this particular case let us perform the mass balance and the momentum balance and see what happens for these particular cases. Now, for mass balance I will just draw it up once more so that it is easier for you. Fluid is entering at u equals to a fluid is going out at u equals to a minus d u here it was p t rho here it was p plus d p t plus d t rho plus d rho and of course, I have already told you that the cross sectional area that is equal to a. Now, from mass balance what do we get mass entering rho a a mass going out rho plus d rho a minus d u a any portion you do not understand it is very simple you can tell me you can just tell me to repeat it. So, therefore, we know that a a cancels out this gives rho a plus a d rho minus rho d u minus d u d rho. So, these also cancel out and we get d u equals to a d rho by rho plus d rho is not it this is the thing which we get. Now, from this particular equation there are two things that we understand first thing is if d rho is positive if d rho is get greater than 0 d u is greater than 0 
right. So, if d rho is greater than 0, d u has to be greater than 0, agreed or in other words whenever such a flow occurs, whenever a compression wave it travels through a fluid, it definitely leaves a fluid moving in the direction of the wave. So, d u d rho yes. is small multiplication of these two small terms. Uh, you, you can we will be neglecting it at the end. You can just write it down as a a d rho by a by rho d rho. Definitely we will be doing it at the end, but I have just written it down. If you want you can cancel it at this particular uh, very beginning by assuming d rho tends to 0. Definitely we will be doing it. Okay. So, for this particular case we find that at from this equation we get two informations. What is one? That definitely when a pressure pulse or a compression wave it travels through a fluid, it leaves a fluid which is traveling at a small velocity in the direction of the wave. Because d u has to be greater than 0 when d rho is greater than 0. This is the first thing that we observe from here. And then we know that within the framework of infinitesimal strength of the wave, we know A itself is also very small. Okay. So, this was about the mass balance. Now, let us take up the momentum balance and we can do it in this particular page as well. If we perform the momentum balance. So, momentum balance what do we get? Momentum in my your uh, for force n minus force out equals to rate of accumulation of momentum. So, from here we get P A if you see that force which is entering it is P A I will just write it down here. So, you can compare and find out minus P plus D P A this is equal to rate of momentum in minus rate of moment sorry yeah rate of momentum out minus rate of momentum in. So, how much momentum mass into velocity mass I have already written it down rho a a. So, it is rho a a into a minus d u minus rho a a into a if the, if you compare this picture this this is going to be the momentum balance agreed all of you. So, on simplifying this we find that we get P A minus P A minus A D P this is equal to again rho A A square minus rho A A D U minus rho A A square they cancel out these cancel out. So, finally, what we are landed up with we are landed up with minus a d p equals to minus a rho a d u is is also they cancel out or in other words d p is nothing but equal to rho a d u. This is the thing sorry very sorry. This is the thing that we get and d u for the expression of d u we can substitute d u from this particular expression is not it. So, if we do it then on substituting what do we get? We get that a square you just substitute it and you will find you get d p d rho to 1 plus d rho by rho. Okay. You can cancel out this term in the very beginning or you can do it at this stage as well in the limit d rho tends to 0 what do we get? a square is nothing but equal to d p d rho. Agreed? You are already probably familiar with this particular expression although I do not know whether you had known the derivation earlier or not. Now, remember one thing this process firstly was adiabatic and reversible. Why? First thing the frictional effects they were confined to the inside of the pressure wave itself. Okay. Since frictional effects are confined to the inside, so therefore we can. So therefore there were no velocity gradients on either side of the wave, and we can assume the process to be reversible. In addition, there were no temperature gradients except inside the wave. So therefore we can assume that the process was adiabatic as well. So therefore remember that we have done this derivation under the condition of adiabatic and reversible process or in other words 
this derivation was done for an isentropic process. So, therefore, putting this condition here, we can write down a square is nothing but equal to del p del rho under isentropic conditions okay? or in other words a equals to root over of which you already know d p d rho at constant s. Now, for a perfect gas or for an ideal gas as we say for most of the conditions as I have already mentioned if the gas is far removed from its liquid state we know p equals to rho r t. So, therefore, if we uh, perform the differentiation we find that p by rho gamma this is equal to constant. So, therefore, a in terms of measurable properties it is nothing but gamma p by rho or in other words it is gamma r t. So, by this particular process we we can first what we did we find out for how to define compressible flows we found that Mach number is important. Now, in order to calculate Mach number what we need we need velocity of sound if we can relate velocity of sound under that particular conditions with measurable parameters it is going to be very convenient. So, the next thing which we did is we related a or we expressed a in terms of temperature the absolute temperature or in terms of pressure and so on. So, we obtained a is nothing but equal to root gamma r t these expressions probably all of you knew from the beginning what you did not know was probably the how we arrived why was Mach number important for compressible flows and why is a equals to root del p del rho at constant s probably these things we were not very clear earlier. Now, whenever we define remember one thing the next thing which I would like to do whenever we define compressible flows whenever the, we define an incompressible suppose water is flowing through a pipe how do we characterize the water we tell that its density is 1 gram per cc the it it is at say room temperature 30 degrees or 25 degrees centigrade it is at 1 atmospheric pressure right. So, moment we tell this we know and it is uh, maybe its volume flow rate is so and so and other things. So, moment we we, we just define its temperature pressure density maybe enthalpy etcetera etcetera the state of the water become fixed any point that from that water if, if we measure the property at any point that is constant or that is the same entire water can be characterized by that property. Now, what about compressible flows compressible flows at every point pressure is different at every point density is different at every point temperature is different. So, what to do about it whenever such a thing happens we have to refer to some standard conditions without standard conditions we there has to be a datum with which we can compare and we can identify or we can characterize the properties. Any idea what are the reference conditions for compressible flows what are the properties which we refer to as because just property does not mean anything for compressible flow which properties any idea you have whether you have heard about the name I would like to know that how do we what are the standard or the datum properties in compressible flows to which we refer to the property under the present situation. You may have heard about the term have you heard about stagnation properties and sonic properties ok. We will be discussing about you have heard about these things is not it. So, therefore, the useful reference conditions Remember one thing compressible fluid and compressible flows are not always the same ok. Useful reference conditions for compressible flows are the stagnation properties they are one set of properties and the sonic properties. Now, what are these let us define them first stagnation itself it means that somewhere the fluid should be at rest and the properties under those conditions. But remember one thing how the fluid has been brought at rest that path is also important for compressible flows the path is also very important how we have brought the fluid at rest. So, therefore, when the fluid is brought isentropically to rest conditions then the property which the fluid has under those 
rest conditions, they are referred to as the stagnation properties. Usually how do we denote them? We denote them with a subscript 0 along with the property like pressure the stagnation pressure is P0, the stagnation temperature is P0, the stagnation density is rho 0. Agreed? So, therefore, the stagnation properties are those properties they are defined as those properties. They are defined as don't those properties which are obtained if local flow were imagined to cease to zero velocity isentropically. This means that whatever equations you have learnt in your thermodynamics for reversible adiabatic flows, all of them can be used in this particular case. So, therefore, we know certain things from energy balance we know that more or less our <laughs> say for such a type of flow suppose we would like to write down just I will go a little back and I would like to write down certain things we will be using these things. For such type of flow, say, say maybe compressible flow, it is flowing a, in one particular cross sectional area, say in this particular cross sectional area A, where the curvature at the central line can be neglected. Okay. So, the, the properties will be va varying at each and every point. So, therefore, they are a fu function of your axial distance. So, therefore, properties are written down in this particular fashion the velocity is used, the area of course, it is A z. Okay. So, from continuity what do we know? We know rho A u equals to constant, w equals to mass flow rate is constant that we already know. A useful form of this equation is to take the log and to perform the logarithmic differentiation. From here we get d rho by rho plus d a by a plus d u by d equals to 0. Okay. And from energy balance what do we get? From energy balance it is just the first law for of, uh, of thermodynamics for open systems from which we get d q d w we are going to neglect this is equal to d h plus d kinetic energy plus d potential energy. Okay. Now, usually we know that the potential energy that can be neglected because in this particular case it can be neglected. So, therefore, and the kinetic energy, I okay, will go to the next page. The kinetic energy per unit mass, this is nothing but equal to u square by 2. Okay. So, if this is substituted in the energy balance in this particular energy balance equation, then we get d q equals to d h plus u d u, is not it? So, the energy equation remember this particular equation this is valid even in presence of friction or non equilibrium condition in integral form. We can write it down as h2 plus u2 square by 2, sorry, equal to h1 plus u1 square by 2 plus q. We can write it down in this particular form, which tells us that sum of enthalpy and kinetic energy it is constant in adiabatic flow, is not it? this term becomes equal to 0. So, therefore, we find h plus u square by 2 this is constant under adiabatic condition. From energy balance equation we get it you can also also get it from the steady form of uh, moment from, from the second law of thermodynamics also you, if you can use it and you can get it by knowing that T d s equals to d h minus v d p is not it by applying that also you can get it. 
Okay. So, therefore, we find that for adiabatic conditions even if there is friction even if there are irreversible effects we know that under adiabatic condition the sum of enthalpy and the kinetic energy of a fluid is constant agreed. So, therefore, at any particular point in a pipe h plus u square by 2 equals to constant agreed. Now, if this particular fluid is isentropically brought to rest then what happens isentropically means it is adiabatic reversible. So, under that condition u becomes equals to 0, h becomes equal to h 0, agreed h 0 is the stagnation enthalpy. Do you get my point? What do I, what do I know? From energy balance I have come to know that under normal conditions we know that the summation of h and the kinetic energy is equal to q. For adiabatic conditions what I know the sum of the enthalpy and kinetic energy this particular sum it always remains constant at any particular portion of the fluid. That means, whenever the flow is occurring from in under whatever condition at each and every cross section h plus u square by 2 that has to be h 1 plus u 1 square by 2 has to be equal to h 2 plus u 2 square by 2 has to be equal to h 3 plus u 3 square by 2. Now, at any particular point if u equals to 0, then in that case that means it has isentropically being brought to 0. Okay. So, under that condition what do we get? We get h is reduces to h 0 the stagnation property. How did we de define the stagnation property? It is those particular properties which are formed when the fluid ceases to move or when a fluid is brought to rest isentropically. You agree? Do you get the point? So, therefore, we can write it down in this particular form that for all the circumstances for adiabatic flow this particular term this is constant. This we can write is not it. So, therefore, the stagnation enthalpy h 0 this is nothing but equal to h plus u square by 2 is not it. This we have got from first law of right we have already dedu deduced it. So, therefore, we get h 0 equals to h square plus uh, h plus u square by 2. Now, for a perfect gas or for an ideal gas I should say h 0 equals to C p t 0 is not it? Okay, t 0 is the stagnation temperature this will be equal to C p t plus u square by 2. You agree with me? Okay. Or in other words we can write it down we can write down u square it is equal to 2 C p t 0 minus t agreed. We know what is C p gamma r by gamma minus 1. So, therefore, this u square can be written down as 2 gamma r by gamma minus 1 t 0 minus t yes or no. Okay. And therefore, we can write down the velocity as root 2 gamma r by gamma minus 1 into yes correct which gives you u max the maximum velocity it is nothing but equal to 2 gamma r t 0 by gamma minus 1 whole to the power half. Can we write this yes or no? So, therefore, from this particular equation from this equation and from this equation what do we deduce from these two equations? We deduce that the total enthalpy and the T 0 are conserved if the process is adiabatic. Remember for these two equations we did not put any condition of reversibility. 
So, for any adiabatic process we can write down the total enthalpy and the stagnation temperature T 0 they are conserved if the process is adiabatic. And what about this? This gives us a relation between the fluid velocity and the local temperature under adiabatic conditions. Everything just adiabatic we are talking. Okay. So, this just gives you a local velocity, a relation between local velocity and the local temperature under adiabatic conditions. Right? Now, once we, we have obtained a particular way of deducing rather finding out T 0. So, in the same way or rather if, if we just proceed further from this particular equation, what do we get? we get C p t 0 equals to C p t plus u square by 2 or in other words we can write it down in this particular way or we can write down T 0 by T this is nothing but 1 plus u square by 2 C p t substituting C p by gamma r by gamma minus 1 we get this is nothing but 1 plus gamma minus 1 by 2 gamma u square by r t. Yes, we have just substituted C p, we have not done anything else. We can get it or in other words, this can be written down as 1 plus gamma minus 1 by 2 m a square. Can we write down this equation? Yes or no, you tell me. We can write it down. So, what have we done? We have expressed our actual our local temperature in terms of the stagnation temperature, right? And we find that the relationship between the local temperature and the stagnation temperature is a function of Mach number, okay? Now, remember for this equation also it is just for adiabatic flow, okay? Now, once we could we could find out a relationship or we could find out an expression to express T 0 by T using the equations of adiabatic reversible flow, the relations connecting P, P to T, rho to T, we can find out rho 0 by rho, we can find out P 0 by P and so on, is not it? So, if we write them down, what do we get? In the same terms, we get P 0 by T, this is equal to T 0 by T into gamma by gamma minus 1 which is equal to 1 plus gamma minus 1 by 2 m a square gamma by gamma minus 1, is not it? Same way we can write rho 0 by rho equals to T 0 by T whole to the power 1 by gamma minus 1 and this is equal to 1 plus gamma minus 1 by 2 m a square 1 by gamma minus 1 is not it? So, therefore, we find out that we are able to relate all the local properties in terms of the stagnation properties. We had started with the first law of, op, uh, of thermodynamics for open systems. We had first considered adiabatic systems. Using that we could express or rather we could find expressions for H 0 and T 0. Then we use expressions of your uh, isentropic conditions and then from there we found out the relationships between P 0 and T 0. Okay? Now, remember one thing that whenever a fluid is flowing the stagnation properties they should vary from point to point depending upon their actual properties, is not it? So, from for each and every point they, they should have different stagnation properties. Now, suppose there is no heat transfer and we can neglect the frictional losses. Then under that conditions we can say that the fluid flow inside the pipe occurs under isentropic conditions. Can we do it? We can do it, is not it? So, the thing is that if we can assume that generally what we find, we find that the stagnation properties they can vary throughout the flow field. But if we assume that the flow is adiabatic or rather then we find h plus u square by 2 is constant throughout the flow field. 
Now, if h plus u square by 2 it is constant throughout the flow field even in the presence of friction, then we can say that all the stagnation properties have to be constant along an isentropic flow, yes or no? Okay. So, therefore, we find that for each and every condition, each and every position, if the condition is maintained isentropic, then under for that situation, even if the properties are varying along different cross sections, but isentropically, if, if the properties are brought to rest under for each and every condition, then the stagnation properties will be the same. And fourth will be the stagnation properties, they will be the properties which the fluid will have if it started from rest in a sta stationary tank or a reservoir. Suppose the flow starts from a reservoir, okay. so from that reservoir the flow is flowing to the pipe and in that pipe we have maintained isentropic conditions, then, there, then in that case the property of the fluid in the reservoir are nothing but the stagnation properties. Is it clear to you? Okay. So, therefore, it is not so very impossible the stagnation properties are varying throughout the flow and therefore, how to find them it is of no use, it is not that. The, the, uh, if for most of the cases we can assume isentropic conditions and for that particular case the flow in the uh, reservoir or, or rather the reservoir where the fluid is at rest, the properties of the fluid in that condition gives you the stagnation properties. Agreed? Now, Next, I would like to tell you about sonic properties. Okay, and remember one thing. There's just one thing which I would like to say. Uh, if we have a reservoir through which the flow is going, then in as I have already mentioned, in this reservoir it is T zero, P zero, and rho zero. Okay, in this particular case, isentropic flow occurs. So, therefore, q equals to 0. So, uh, f, uh, so the, if we measure the properties here, we know the isentropic properties. And remember one thing, total enthalpy and T0 is conserved for an adiabatic process, irrespective of whether there are frictional losses or not. If there are frictional losses, then we find that T0 and H0 does not change, but in contrast T0 and rho 0, they decrease if there is friction. So, for isentropic conditions H0, P0, T0, rho 0 nothing changes, if it is adiabatic H0, T0 is conserved, but T0 and rho 0 they decrease. Okay. Next is sonic properties, sonic properties are the properties when Ma becomes equal to 1, is not it. So, and these properties they are denoted by an asterisk. So, they are denoted by P star, they are denoted by rho star, T star, H star, A star, everything. Okay. So, how to express this? In whatever equations we have obtained, if M A is reduced to 1, for M A equals to 1, we can get the corresponding P star, rho star, T star, everything values. Okay. So, accordingly, these properties are attained if the local fluid is imagined to expand or compress adiabatically, uh, sorry isentropically till it reaches m equals to 1. There till the fluid is brought to rest isentropically, in this particular case the fluid is either imagined to expand or compress isentropically till m a becomes equal to 1. So, therefore, what do we get? T 0 by T star, simply what we do instead of T, it is T star, the moment it is T star m a becomes equal to 1. When m a becomes equal to 1, it is just 1 plus gamma minus 1 by 2 or in other words, this can be written down as gamma plus 1 by 2. Okay. Same way p 0 by p star, this is nothing but 1 plus gamma by 2 into gamma by gamma minus 1. Same way rho 0 by rho star, it can be written as 1 plus gamma by 2, 1 by gamma minus 1. Agreed? And we know for diatomic gases gamma is equals to 1.4. So, accordingly you can find out the values of, uh, of T star, P star, rho star and so on and so forth. Now, these were the important reference properties for compressible flows, stagnation properties, sonic properties. We have found out how to express the velocity of sound in terms of measurable parameters, why Mach number is so very important, etcetera, etcetera. 
tomorrow we will be discussing about the choked flow conditions, we will be discussing how the effect of or rather how area change influences your flow properties. We already know that whenever there is an area change there is acceleration even for incompressible flows, is not it? The pressure changes, the velocity changes, okay? the velocity changes that happens for incompressible flows as well. In this particular case your width area, your velocity will change, your pressure will change, your density will change. So, how the situation becomes when we are dealing with area changes in compressible flows, we will find out, we will be discussing the choked flow conditions and we will proceed in this particular manner. Thank you very much.